Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Michael Jones. Um, I'm the CEO of Sail Garden Systems, and I'm going to be chairing the webinar today. Um, I can see that there are participants still joining us at a fairly rapid rate. So we'll just hang on for another 30 seconds or so and start. So uh, while we're waiting, um, maybe I can tell you a little bit about Cell Guidance Systems. Um, we're based in Cambridge uh, in the UK, and we are a specialist provider of research reagents and services for uh, biomedical research. And uh, we're hosting this webinar today to tell you about uh, peptigel, uh, hydrogel technology. And as some of you may be aware, peptigel was until quite recently sold by Magister Biogel. And uh, we've recently taken over the peptigel uh, products and we're manufacturing and supporting those products uh, from our facility. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, introducing our speakers. Um, the first speaker we have today is uh, Professor Aileen Miller, and she's a professor of uh, biomolecular engineering at the University of Manchester. And she's going to be talking for about 30 minutes, uh, giving a general overview of the Peptigel technology and applications. And then we're going to be looking at uh, specific examples with Seb Doherty Boyd, who's a PhD researcher at the University of Glasgow. So I think um, we're about ready to start and I'd like to um, invite Aileen to give her presentation. Thank you, Aileen. So thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. And I'm really pleased to be here today to tell you a little bit about synthetic peptide hydrogels and their use as scaffolds for 2D and 3D cell cultures. Um, so as uh, was said, I uh, um, are an academic within Manchester and we work a lot in developing materials and use them for different applications. And we focus a lot on cell culture. Um, mainly because, as you'll see, the peptide hydrogels are, are structure is reminiscent of extracellular matrix, and that is used effectively as a scaffold um, for cells to go into, uh, cling on to, move around to, get instructed by to do uh, whatever that cell is required to do, whether that's differentiate, if it's a stem cell, into um, a, a particular cell line, or then to proliferate in number, or to excrete proteins and uh, uh, create tissues. So there's a whole array of different cell types that people are using in the literature. Um, more and more uh, work has been developed in and around stem cells and organoids, for example. Um, and then also moving towards applications. So organoids are a big growth area at the moment, which organoids are three-dimensional clusters of cells that come together and that organoid, that cluster is uh, reminiscent and has the function of the individual body part. So kidney, liver, um, uh, uh, lung, etc. cetera. Um, and these are being used uh, a lot at the moment for uh, understanding fundamentals of the uh, organs in terms of cell biological pathways, but also then using those organoids for uh, drug testing, drug screening. So pharma companies can identify uh, their target molecule um earlier uh, and save money in the in the sort of the r d side and um, they're also being used a lot uh, we've got a lot of potential in and around personalized medicines so we can potentially use uh, and extract um uh, human cells stem cells so from your your own body uh, grow up your own organoids uh, in obviously a controlled environment um, and then test the drugs or test a cocktail of drugs um that can then define which ones will work best uh, uh, for you and at what point is that intervention needed a lot of work also with cell uh, culture focused in, in and around tissue engineering and regenerative medicine uh, and that's where we're looking to also understand fundamental cell biology, but also develop tissues in vitro, so reducing the number of animals um, that are that are used uh, um, 
uh, within the science and tech space at the moment, um, and also for regenerative medicine applications as we look, we've got a, 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 an aging population, so how can we use our uh, cell biology and scaffold technology to help um, give people enhanced quality uh, of, of life as we age. Um, and then it's all the way around to a um, uh, big growth area within cancer and tumour biology, huge advancements in our ability to probe uh, cell biological pathways, and looking for specific biomarkers and chains of, of, of the, the biological um, pathway within tumours as, as tumours grow and age and spread within the body. And we can actually then use the scaffolds to grow these types of tumours in vitro um, to understand uh, uh, and, and, and develop our understanding as well as develop new therapies. So it's kind of just a, a very brief overview of the huge potential um, and growth area that is 2D, 3D cell culture. Of course, for a lot of this, um, cells need something to, to stick in, stick onto, to grow on, to be able to survive, proliferate, and express uh, the proteins and matrices that they want to go on to do. So for that, you need uh, typically a hydrogel scaffold. Hydrogel's 90 nine percent water so very akin to our human tissue and there's various different types of biomaterial scaffold that people tend to look at one is sort of natural system so this is where you're looking at polysaccharides protein-based materials and um, so things like alginates um uh, cellulose, protein type uh, material, collagens, etc. Um, so typically they're natural, so they are biocompatible. They've quite often got some kind of functionality embedded uh, within those scaffolds. Um, because they're natural systems, there is sometimes uh, uh, a tendency to have batch to batch variation, not defined, typically not scalable, um, uh, majority are not translatable, and it's difficult sometimes to vary the mechanical strength to match sort of different human tissues. The most commonly uh, derived um, scaffold used uh, by about 70% of people doing uh, using scaffolds in cell culture is something called mate gel um, and it's derived from mouse sarcoma cells so typically uh, the mouse is injected with the tumor the tumor is grown in the mouse so this is a picture of the mouse with the tumor here the tumor is extracted it's decellularized and then sold as mate gel so three mice typically are sacrificed to make every 10 milliliters of product. So to meet today's market demand, there's about 10 million mice every year are culled um, just to make a, a consumable product in, in, in the lab. So this is a, a, a big ethical issue, uh, obviously. Um, and also because it's an animal derived product, it's not translatable. So whatever research you're doing in the lab, it can't be then translated and used within the clinic. Every mouse is different, every tumour is different, so you've got big batch-to-batch -batch variability, and that's really well known um, uh, within the community. Uh, and it's actually sort of a whole uh, bag of uh, growth factors embedded within the Matrigel product itself, which um, people don't know exactly what they are. And this varies then also between batch-to-batch, -batch, and one of the reasons why you don't get good uh, reproducibility. Um, it's not tunable, so it's got one uh, mechanical strength, so stiffness of the gel, which is quite low, actually. It's about 10 pascals, um, and they're quite often difficult to handle. You've got to put it on ice, bring it back up to room temperature. So I use a technical term. It's a bit of a faff to use. Um, so that that's sort of the, the, the main natural uh, product. The other side of things is a synthetic system. So this is where you've got metal, ceramics, polymers. Um, Generally, they, they've got limited biocompatibility unless you do extra steps to functionalize them um, and you need chemicals and steps, extra steps to do that. Pros, they're typically because you can make them, they're reproducible, they're fully defined, they are scalable, uh, can be cost effective and typically they're they're made so they're ethical um, uh, as long as you don't worry too much about the solvents made to make the materials. So one class of materials that I like to say combines the pros of both natural and synthetic materials and that's peptide hydrogels. So peptides are made from amino acids um, uh, and typically these uh, amino acids come together in oligomers so you know, they can be anything from two to 16 typically. Um, so they are biocompatible and they have got functionality embedded within them because they're natural systems. Um, they're typically reproducible and fully defined scalable in terms of you can make these peptides in the lab 
uh, and their scale scale synthesis is well known and uh, implemented already, uh, cost effective and of course ethical because um, uh, they're not animal derived. So this is a summary of, of our work uh, over a number of years, um, how we use the self-assembling peptides. So typically we've got amino acids, different amino acids, different charged, non-charged, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. So different colors or different properties. We typically work with about eight to 12 amino acids in our peptide molecule. These molecules self-assemble in the beta sheet fibrous structure. It's quite a dynamic process. So peptides actually come on and also off. Um, but then they uh, get, uh, uh, form the fiber, these fibers form uh, branch points or entangle or both and uh, form this fibrous three-dimensional hydrogel network that can then be used as a scaffold for cells to sit in, embed within, uh, sometimes attached to the fibrous structures and then grow and proliferate. So here's an example of the gel in some cell culture uh, media here. Okay, so this is a schematic uh, of that, that video that you saw, which actually summarizes about at least 10 years worth of work in our group. Um, so this is one of our sort of our workhorse uh, peptides. Um, it's an octopeptide. It's got phenylalanine as the hydrophobic group, um, glutamic acid uh, as the, sort of the negatively charged group and lysine as the positively charged group. So these molecules come together uh, in the beta sheet fiber. You actually have two sort of fibrils coming together to form one fiber because you end up with a hydrophilic face and a hydrophobic face. And in water, the hydrophobic groups want to bury themselves. So they come together to form these fibers. These fibers then entangle branch. And this is an example TEM. Uh, if you can see, these are the fibers here. Uh, so the, the width of one peptide uh, molecule. And they, uh, in this example, they branch to form the three-dimensional hydrogel network. You can see the twist within the fiber, uh, which is the, due to the uh, amino acids all being uh, L amino acids. So you've got a natural helical twist to the beta sheet fiber, um, and then you can form the self-supporting hydrogels. So in our group, we typically uh, play around with the chemistry or we have played around with the chemistry of the molecule and the chemistry of the molecule does matter in terms of the type of properties of the hydrogel that you end up with. This is one example of varying uh, peptide chemistry. Um, we've typically either switched around the charged groups or changed the hydrophobicity of the hydrophobic group uh, from phenylalanine to valine to leucine. And you can see this is uh, uh, the elastic modulus, the G prime, so how stiff the material is or how resistant it is to shear. Um, and you can toggle uh, you know, a couple of orders of magnitude in terms of the elasticity of the material. Um, we can actually also go up into tens of thousands of pascals, um, but that's quite stiff from a biological perspective. Um, we've got other applications for those, those types of materials. But that just gives you an indication, change the chemistry, change the properties. These materials are shear thinning, um, so you can apply shear and they will flow just like toothpaste in a tube, um, uh, so which means you can inject uh, the hydrogels and they'll reform as soon as they come out the end of the needle. And you can spray the hydrogels uh, from, this is just a simple uh, nozzle uh, button, uh, uh, a chemist that any are available on the high street, um, and you can spray them in injection and, and they'll reform the hydrogel straight away. This is just examples of the hydrogel. This is brown because we've incorporated graphene. We're from Manchester, so contractually obliged to include graphene into something. Um, uh, and that's an example. And, and we do some work, uh, specific applications with those types of materials. OK, so what I'm going to talk about now is focusing around sort of the, the 3D cell culture aspect of the work. And that's where we will look at uh, taking our hydrogels, which uh, are commercially available as peptogels. And um, so these are our peptide hydrogels. We will mix them with our cells. We tend to like to focus on 3D uh, cell culture because it's more reminiscent than of the situation in the body. Um, but we've got protocols for 2D cell work as well. Um, so we can mix the cells within the hydrogel. The hydrogel is designed to then stiffen once it's in contact with the cell culture media uh, from the cells suspension and or then when you pop uh, a cell culture media on top. So the gel will stiffen and effectively fix the cells in place um, uh, as you add the media and you incubate. 
for a certain period of time and then they're ready to go uh, to do your assays and analysis. So they're really easy to use, ready to use and they're stable at room temperature so you don't need to do any ice bucket uh, cooling, uh, uh, thawing steps, etc. So this is a video uh, just to show you that cells are incorporated within three dimensions within the hydrogel. So this is an example of mesenchymal stem cells and we stained the nuclei uh, and, and scanned through uh, to show uh, the, the, the nice even distribution of cells in the system. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you some examples now of sort of the different types of cells that we've incorporated within the hydrogels. And we've done various types of, of, of systems over, over the years. Um, a lot of it in collaboration um, with Julie Goff in Manchester, who is a biomaterials cell person. Um, and then I'll, I'll highlight uh, uh, the others as we go along. So this was one of the, it wasn't the first, but it was one of the earlier examples of a student working in our group, Lewis, um, who was a dentist actually by training. So he was interested in periodontal repair. Um, so we looked at human osteoblasts, um, and this is the osteoblast at day 14 stained for effactin um, and collagen, which is then stained uh, that you see red. And he was then interested in that over longer time periods um, were the osteoblasts uh, depositing calcium for effectively repairing your, your, your tooth. Um, and the answer is yes. So this is uh, the calcium staining that you can see within the hydrogels um, and you're getting a good amount deposited. So he's now working and developing these materials for, uh, or for periodontal repair um, uh, in Mexico. Um, one other example, so this was sort of a single cell uh, incorporated within a three-dimensional hydrogel. This is taking the, the model just a little bit step Further, so this is where we've got a co-culture. So we've got um, fibroblast cells embedded within the uh, hydrogel. So you can see that the fibroblasts are, are, are growing um, nicely. And then on top, you've got epithelial cells. Um, this was, I should say, for the uh, repair of the um, uh, the throat, the esophagus. So effectively, uh, this is to treat um, Barrett's esophagus syndrome, which effectively is, uh, uh, you get a lot of acid reflux and it burns the surface of your esophagus and you want to basically try to repair it uh, because otherwise you end up with a lot of scar formation. Scar tissue uh, is tight and it takes up a lot of space. And essentially the current treatment is putting a balloon down your throat and pumping the balloon to try to cause, uh, to open up the esophagus so you can swallow. Um, oh, the other treatment is scraping away the scar tissue. And of course that leaves open wounds, which creates more scar tissue. So it's it's, it's a bit of a, a, a cyclic uh, snowball uh, a, a situation. So we were trying to use hydrogels to be able to spray onto the surface of the throat to effectively re-epithelialize the esophagus. So this is where we've got fibroblasts and the, the, the heart of the hydrogel. And then on top, uh, we've got epithelial cells to try to regenerate that surface of the esophagus. And you can see from uh, the histology that you have the nice re-epithelialization um, or you have epithelialization and forming a nice um, unified monolayer and then we're looking at the morphology and you get this sort of mottled effect and a nice covering and that is 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 as expected for the epithelial cells um so that work is is continuing on again uh, in in manchester one other example is looking at neuronal growth so this is where we've taken rat dorsal root ganglion neurons and we've popped them into two different hydrogels so this is what's called an alpha one and an alpha two hydrogel so um, neutral hydrogel and a positively charged hydrogel and you can see that neuron you get neuronal outgrowth and sprouting um, and we can monitor and, and view this and the neurons are actually functional and you can send signals through them so this has got a, a promising um, application for uh, nerve regeneration um, and Alessandro Ferroni uh, did that work in collaboration with Adam Reed. And again, that's ongoing. Um, and then the last example here, working with cell lines, is looking at hepatic stellate cells. So here we're looking at uh, the effect of stiffness on the hydrogel. So we've got an alpha 2, which is another positive hydrogel, and a gamma 2, the same peptide, so the same charge, but one's 
stiff and one's uh, soft. Um, and we're looking at then the outcome of the cell culture um, and the hepatic stellate cells in thinking about then using these for uh, drug toxicity types of screening. So you can see that the, the um, alpha-2 is a slightly better system uh, for growing uh, these cells in terms of speed of growth and uh, or speed of proliferation and function as well. So those are some examples of the cell lines. We can also do a lot of work with stem cells. Um, here, this example is uh, coming back to the dental repair, but this is looking at um, stem cells and controlling their differentiation. So here we have got uh, human mesenchymal stem cells um, and we're differentiating them into osteoblasts for the calcium deposition and tooth repair application. And we're using um, stimuli that we're putting into the cell culture media to uh, induce that stem cell differentiation. And you can see that it's working very well when you compare the non-stimulated to the stimulated images. So taking um, Alessandro's work that little bit further in terms of looking at uh, the rats, um, let me move this down, uh, the rat adipose derived stem cells. So here um, uh, we're taking these uh, adipose derived stem cells, so the fat derived stem cells, and we've popped them into uh, uh, different scaffolds and compared to collagen and their alpha 2 system, which is slightly more charged uh, or is charged in comparison to the alpha one, which is neutral. So you're getting the nice uh, adipose derived stem cells. And here you can actually see the stem cells starting to uh, eat and um, digest uh, the um, peptide hydrogel matrix. So over time, uh, the cells are uh, taking over the matrix, depositing their own matrix and digesting away uh, the, the peptide hydrogel, uh, which is actually what you want. So you don't need any additional interventions um, uh, uh, if you're using them for regenerative medicine applications. So thinking about uh, uh, another example, this is rat cardiac progenitor stem cells. So this is looking at cardiac repair and um, this attracted quite a lot of press attention two years ago, 18 months ago, and um, where we're looking at using the hydrogels to take stem cells and effectively create in vitro hearts, but then also thinking about uh, injecting for cardiac uh, repair to help repair damaged tissues after cardiac infarction, so heart attacks. So that stops then hopefully then the progression onto heart failure, which is uh, the biggest um, uh, 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 killer effectively um, at the moment uh, uh, globally. So here we're looking at uh, different, um, this is a standard, here we've got a, a, sort of a neutral peptide and here we've got a functionalized peptide. And this is also showing that functionalization, so RGD is quite a common cell, fun, uh, cell recognition sequence and um, helps cells attach and grow in some situations. And it has done in terms of these stem cell, uh, cardiac progenitor stem cells that have gone on to differentiate um, and form heart tissue. So one last example was uh, from Niall Tracy. This is working um, in collaboration with John Crean's group over in University College Dublin. And this is where, you know, uh, as we've talked through all this sort of work, um, showing examples, but it's also highlighting and we've got the protocols in the publications and online of being able to not only just mix cells within the scaffolds, but we can then do uh, cell culture assays. So live dead, staining for different um, uh, uh, protein uh, markers, uh, then uh, doing uh, qPCR, for example, which is extracting out uh, your, your uh, target RNA DNA to then uh, do further analysis on. And here then we're looking at single cell analysis. Uh, so we're taking those protocols into more and more complex assays and those are available so uh, uh, you can then work out what's happening in terms of your uh, cell culture and the fate of your cells within the matrices. So this is looking at human induced pluripotent stem cell differentiation um, and this was then in particular looking at uh, transforming them into uh, kidney organoids um, uh, and, and, and there's a great comparison in this paper um, uh, of these peptide hydrogels against matrigel. So as we move more and more then towards uh, sort of thinking about 
more complex applications. So this is an example where we're looking and developing organoids um, and we can, these hydrogels are 3D printable. So you can uh, print them and create three dimensional structures, but you can also use them in liquid handling instruments. So here we're printing small droplets, uh, microliter droplets. You can go down to nano uh, dro droplets and we've done that, but we want to incorporate cells uh, within these systems. And in this case, we wanted to incorporate organoids in, in the system. So we've done a lot of different types of organoids and, and example, exemplified liver, kidney, cardiac and cancer organoids. Um, and you can see this is just some of the examples uh, uh, that we printed single organoids. They're functional within the systems, uh, 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 so they can then be used for high throughput uh, drug discovery uh, systems. So we're working um, with our partners, QKIN and Celeste, um, on developing uh, these systems uh, uh, as well. So just thinking about organoid systems. So we have uh, uh, thinking about replicating in vitro, what happens in vivo. So this one example is looking at uh, the tumor microenvironment. So here you've got the in vivo system. So you've got blood flow circulating around it. You've got your tumor cells, you've got your matrix, um, and you have the necrotic core uh, within the tumor. And there's many groups uh, working on trying to replicate this in vivo, in vitro, so they can understand. So tumor microenvironment is typically characterized by an increase in tissue stiffness, a low acidity, elevated temperatures, and the nice thing about the peptide hydrogels is we can simultaneously and independently tune each of these to mimic healthy tissue and the tumor tissue, but also then to mimic the tumor tissue at different points in disease progression because it stiffens and becomes more acidic as the disease uh, 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 has time to, to um, grow and form uh, in vivo. So um, can we do this in, in vitro? So this is an example where we've taken cancer cells, mesenchymal stem cells and HUVEC cells to really start to bring in vascularization. So really moving towards uh, a replicative um, in vitro model of uh, in vivo systems. So you can see these are the, the tumor organoids. They have been vascularized, as you can see from the HUVEC cells. So uh, we're starting to be able to do drug tox screening systems on these organoid systems. One further example, which is in collaboration with Armando Del Rio Hernandez at Imperial College London, and that's where we've taken hydrogel, soft one, uh, uh, stiffer hydrogel here, and changed the pH independently. Um, and in between the pHs, we've matched the stiffness. So you can actually then start to do mechanical transduction signaling pathway studies. Um, and that's what Armando is interested in. And he's been able to highlight that you can see different cell biological pathways. Uh, so different markers in terms of YAP and, and HIF1 alpha uh, progressing at different time points. And that influences uh, microtubule formation within the tumor. And in some cases it forms and in other cases it doesn't form. And that tubule is actually the target for many chemotherapy agents. So it starts to tell you and give you information about which chemotherapy agents are going to be effective at different stages of the cancer development. So Amanda's very excited about that. Um, and we've published a couple of papers on it so far and that uh, more are gonna be coming out. So it's an exciting area, uh, an application area of the hydrogels. So just to finish off, really, I just wanted to talk about then taking sort of the cell biology into an in, in vivo uh, environment. So um, what do we need to do? We need to look at what happens to the hydrogel uh, when you put it into the body. So this is we've radio labeled uh, the hydrogel and looked at it uh, uh, with these uh, uh, rat models. And you can see that the solution and the hydrogel um, uh, uh, goes into the kidney and is excreted out by the kidney. Uh, and effectively what happens is that it goes through the body and comes out uh, through the urine, uh, through, the, through the bladder. So there's no accumulation in the body. We've also done um, uh, uh, immune response tests and looked at uh, here we've taken the hydrogel, we've included quantum dot labeled cells, uh, popped them. This is particularly focused on a cardiac application. So we've shown that you can inject the cells, they remain at the injection site. There's no uh, uh, or limited immune response over significant periods of time. And then with that, we went on and, and delivered cardiac progenitor stem cells to uh, a model infarcted. Hearts. That's where we're inducing a heart attack and creating scar tissue. 
And we've shown that um, this is looking at heart volume. So this is looking at the chamber volume. Um, and you can see with the control, which is red, the chamber volume increases after the heart attack, which is effectively the heart swelling. The heart swelling, your heart's got to, uh, muscles got to work harder to be able to get delivery of the blood around the body, uh, which this ultimately leads to heart failure. But you get much uh, lower swelling um, uh, in comparison to how it was before, which is the dotted line when you have the hydrogels present and when you have the hydrogels delivered with the stem cells. So this is a promising treatment um, for cardiac repair. So what I've kind of shown you or hope to show you today is that we've got a platform uh, of uh, hydrogel made from peptide materials and they're used within a plethora of biomedical applications talked about tissue engineering and regeneration for cell culture today and we've got a whole uh, load of other work looking at drug delivery and drug discovery applications which more than happy to talk about if anyone's interested and effectively they're blank canvases so we can introduce any kind of functionality uh, we've got various examples in our group of, of peptides proteins polymers uh, dna for for diagnostics uh, embedded within the hydrogel so it's a nice simple scalable technological platform that comes with all the the, the usps um uh, that are really good for reproducible and reliable cell culture so I'd just like to thank uh, the group, thank my collaborator, in particular, Abhishek Sayani, who I run a joint group with. Um, and he's now a professor in, in pharmacy within Manchester. And thank you, thank you for your attention. And I think I'll be taking questions at the end, but thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Aileen. That's that's really great. Um, fantastic overview of the, uh, the, the technology. So um, I should have said at the outset, um, please, if you have any questions, just pop them into the... Q&A box, which is at the bottom left of your screen. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that using Zoom. Um, and um, as Aileen said there, we're going to take questions um, after the second talk, which will be a little bit shorter talk. And this is a more sort of focused uh, talk, I think, on a specific application. But that was a great overview. Thank you. Thank you, Aileen. Um, whilst I remember as well, um, the web address for cell guidance systems in i'll put that in the the q a and we'll we'll follow up after the um the webinar and send you out more information um so you'll have that web address so you can um come and uh, view the range of peptigel products um on the website so uh let's move on and if uh, seb is ready um seb can you um Deliver your talk, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Sebastian Doherty Boyd. I'm a member of the Lifetime CDT and a third year PhD student at the University of Glasgow. And I'm going to be talking to you today about my project, which is entitled Developing Synthetic Bone Marrow Niches for Testing Novel Leukemia Therapies. So, first, a little bit of background on the bone marrow niche. Hematopoietic stem cells, or HSCs, are responsible for the process of hematopoiesis, the continuous production of blood and immune cells. They natively reside within the bone marrow niche, where they're maintained by a complex variety of stimuli, many of which are illustrated in the diagram on the right. One of the most important of these stimuli in the context of my research are mesenchymal stem cells, which coexist with the HSCs within the niche and maintain them using juxtacrine and paracrine signals. When HSCs are removed from the niche and cultured under standard tissue culture conditions, they rapidly differentiate. And one of our goals is to develop a bone marrow model in order to facilitate the development of therapies for bone marrow associated disorders therefore overcoming this limitation of not being able to culture hematopoietic stem cells in vitro. So the model we're trying to develop is uh, uses short amphiphatic peptides that were originally developed by Aileen Miller's group and are now being sold by Cell Guidance Systems. And these short amphiphatic peptides self-assemble in a pH time and temperature dependent manner into fibrils, which at a high enough concentration form a mesh and then are able to hold water and then gelate. And the idea is that this gel 
mechanically stimulates mesenchymal stem cells that are cultured underneath it. The MSCs are additionally stimulated by a variety of coatings, which are layered onto the surface the mesenchymal stem cells are cultured on, on before they're added. So first off, we have polyethyl acrylate, which is plasma polymerized onto a TCP or tissue culture plastic surface. And the idea behind the inclusion of PEA is that it causes fibronectin, which is coated on top of the PEA, to adopt an open fibrillar network conformation. And this means that the fibronectin is then able to bind to growth factors such as PMP2, which is additionally included in the system. And the idea is that the fibronectin, when it's in this open conformation, presents its RGD domain, as well as its growth factor binding domain with BMP2 bound to the mesenchymal stem cells, which has been shown in the literature to synergistically signal the mesenchymal stem cells. And all of these stimuli together, uh, we hope, will promote the niche-like phenotype that we're after in the mesenchymal stem cells, causing them to produce the same paracrine signals that they do within the uh, in vivo bone marrow niche, which work their way up through the gel and maintain hematopoietic stem cells that are cultured on top of the gel. And here it is all put together and we assemble it within well plates. So initially what we did, we wanted to ensure that the surfaces were doing what we thought they were doing. This is a very well characterized system, but we wanted to go over it anyway. And yes, we showed that using atomic force microscopy, PEA coating plates does in fact cause fibronectin to adopt a more open fibrillar network conformation, as you can see on the right here, as opposed to the more globular conformation that fibronectin adopts when it's just coated on bare TCP, as shown on the left. We also used ELISA in order to demonstrate that BMP2 absorption increases when fibronectin is in a more open conformation on polyethyl acrylate as opposed to on tissue culture plastic. We then wanted to look at which of the various gels that are available best suit our needs, so best stimulate the mesenchymal stem cells, causing them to adopt the phenotype that we want. Uh, and in order to do this, we used confocal immunofluorescence microscopy to look at uh, the levels of nestin and SCF protein expression within the cells. Uh, nestin and SCF expression is linked to the cells adopting this niche-like phenotype that we were after. And what we showed was that the Delta-1 and Alpha-2 gels both strongly promote this niche-like phenotype and even outcompete collagen, which had previously been shown to promote the phenotype that we were after very strongly. Uh, and then one of the potential applications of this system that we've developed is that it could potentially be used to develop a novel therapy for leukemia. And leukemia is a disease that's caused by blood cells growing out of control. It's a type of cancer and it resulted in 4,830 deaths in the UK between 2017 and 2019 alone, according to Cancer Research UK. And CAR-T is a novel leukemia treatment that has shown recent promise in treating some forms of leukemia. It uses autologous genetically engineered T cells in order to attack the leukemic cells and could potentially provide long-term protection from leukemia remission. However, it can't currently be used in order to treat the most deadly form of leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, without also causing anemia, as there are no specific surface markers that can be used to differentiate healthy hematopoietic stem cells from diseased leukemic uh, hematopoietic cells. So what we're trying to do is to develop a way to make hematopoietic stem cells and their progeny invisible to CAR-T therapy. So we were looking at various different surface markers and settled on CD33, which is a non-functional myeloid cell surface marker. And we aim to knock out CD33 in hematopoietic stem cells using CRISPR. And the idea is that then we can 
introduce a mixed population of CD33 redirected CAR T cells, as well as CD33 negative edited hematopoietic stem cells into a patient. The CD33 redirected CAR T cells will then eliminate any leukemic cells, as well as any other CD33 positive cells within the patient, while the edited CD33 negative hematopoietic stem cells will be able to reestablish the hematopoietic system, mm -hmm. therefore sidestepping this problem of anemia. And we want to demonstrate this using a version of our bone marrow niche model. Uh, CRISPR, which is the method that we're using in order to knock out CD33, is uh, based on the bacterial immune response to viruses. It's a high re highly reliable and efficient method of knocking out target genes. And we used flow cytometry in order to analyze the efficiency of our CD33 knockouts. So initially what we were doing was using THP1s as a HSC model. And what we showed was in THP1s, we're able to very efficiently knock out CD33 using the method that we developed and that this knockout is stable up to 30 days. It's primarily caused by single insertions in exon two and three of CD33 and uh, edited cells grow similarly to unedited cells. So this uh, very stark change where CD33 is, is knocked out almost completely is not in fact due to the edited cells outcompeting the unedited cells. So this is a very positive result. So my future plans include testing the precision of CAR T cells on a mixed population of CD33 positive and negative cells, then doing this within our system, ensuring that it doesn't affect the feeder layer of mesenchymal stem cells that's included in the system as well. Uh, we also need to validate our CD33 knockouts in hematopoietic stem cells, as opposed to only in the hematopoietic stem cell model cells that we've been using up until this point. And we want to demonstrate the selectivity of CAR T cells on the a mixed population of edited CD33 negative hematopoietic stem cells, as well as CD33 positive leukemic cells in our system as the final stage of my project. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you to all of these wonderful people, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, sir. Really interesting uh, presentation. So um, we have quite a few questions lined up. If you think of any more questions as we're answering these, please uh, type them in, and we'll get through as many as we can uh, in the next 15 minutes. Um, so just starting in, in order of the... Um, question. Um, the first one here, I don't have a name, um, but it's asking under which conditions the Pepshow gels gelate, specifically in vivo, such as esophageal application. Also, what is the degradation rate and stability in vivo? I think that's probably one for Aileen. Hi, yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so under what conditions do the pep to gels form a gel. Um, so they are, as they're sold from uh, cell guidance systems, they are already a gel in the, the, the true definition sense of the word. So they're already quite viscous. Um, but when you then use and follow the, the 3D cell protocol or the 2D cell protocol, um, you then expose the gels to the cells and expose the gels to cell culture media. And the salts within the cell culture media helps um, uh, uh, solidify or set the gel, um, make it just that little bit stronger through, it's effectively through salt screening uh, of the, the peptide fibers. Um, and that really helps uh, 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 create sort of a solid 3D uh, gel network. And when I say solid, I don't mean hard like the desk. It's it's still uh, soft in terms of uh, uh, cell uh, behavior and still malleable, um, but it's stable. Um, under what conditions of the degradation rate and stability in vivo? Um, it all depends on where you put the gel and the type of environment that you uh, expose the gel to. So, uh, for example, if you just put the gel uh, on 
plate it on the bottom of a cell culture plate um, and you put media on top, then typically if you're careful with your media changes, then it can last anything from one week up to 28 days. And we've got some now um, that we're looking at two months uh, stability. Um, in vivo, it all depends, as I said, on where you put it. Is it a harsh environment with lots of enzymes that's going to digest the gel? Um, or is it in sort of a stable uh, environment um, where it will sort of last? We typically find, we've done several sort of in vivo experiments, um, and we find that the gel, like in the cardiac application, it was there after four to six weeks. Um, in a drug delivery type applications for endometriosis, it's there for about three or four weeks. Uh, and, at, you know, at some point, what you want is the gel to degrade, uh, to lay down its own matrix. Uh, and then the, jet, the peptogel degrades and then, and then moves away and you're left with the scaffold that is the cell's own matrix. So it just kind of depends a bit uh, on where, where you put it. Um, I hope that's sort of answered answered the question. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Anna. I think this this next one's for you as well. I think the the first few, obviously, you gave your talk talk first, so they're they're for you. And then there are some questions I see for Seb coming as well. Um, so, is it possible to harvest the cells from the peptigels for molecular analysis? And does the recommendation uh, work with all kind of peptigels, specifically alpha four plus? Um, yeah, there are protocols that you can do to um, isolate um, a DNA for qPCR, for example, or there's um, protocols to isolate the cells. It's not uh, it's not um, a five minute experiment. You know, you have to sort of look at a, a dilution, but there are protocols and, and things that we can do to help you with that. Um, they are sort of designed predominantly for alpha-4 uh, and alpha-4 plus uh, peptide systems because it's one of the more common commonly used systems uh, for cell culture so yeah we've we've got those and cell guidance systems have got those and if you get stuck then then come and talk to uh, myself and alberto who's, who's down the corridor uh, who can help you with that and we can put you in touch with people in our group who, who do that routinely um which um, hydrogel would you recommend peptigel for sprayable applications mm. it's a good question i saw that um uh, th they should all spray uh but they're all different stiffnesses for if i was to say uh choose one i would probably go with alpha four because it's slightly softer um and it's 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 a uh, uh, speed of regelling upon shear is, is very fast um so that's the one i'd probably recommend but they all do shear thin and they will all spray um, once you go above about 10 kilopascals in elastic properties, then it's you have to really force it and it's harder. Um, but yeah, those ones are, are all right to use. So Aki is asking, if you were to mix in functional peptides, e.g. binding sites for adhesion receptors or ligands for other cell surface receptors, how does that affect the mechanical properties of the gels? Yeah, it does affect the mechanical properties, even though you're doping them in in quite small percentages, it will affect it. Typically, we find that it increases the mechanical strength slightly because you're adding in extra amino acids and it's helping with sort of the binding. But then we kind of can um, uh, uh, compensate uh, for that by varying sort of the formulation. So you can do a comparison between a non-functionalized and a functionalized gel and the same mechanical strengths. Um, so we, we can do that because we can we, we know how to, to manipulate that. But typically adding stuff in general, if it's got a bit of hydrophobicity or amphiphil amphiphilicity, it will strengthen the gel. Um, not in all cases, I have to say, but in the majority. Thank you. Um, so Lou Devine, hopefully I've pronounced your name correctly, is asking, how similar are the peptide fibers to collagen fibers? Um, so there's slightly different structural properties. So the peptide, you know, is very uh, much beta sheet forming systems. And if I remember correctly, uh, collagen is like this, this alpha helical twist in system to it. So they are different building blocks, different sized of building blocks um, and different structure within the fibers themselves they're both fibrous but the different substructures within the units and also then the fibers have got slightly different flexibilities um, and ability to maneuver around when cells go in and, and move around and and, and grow and, and so on and so forth and they're much so, easier to functionalize 
So there's a lot more flexibility. Uh, Lidavine, again, asking, um, because there are different types of pet gel, how does researcher choose which one to test? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, if you're not sure, then get in touch and ask. Um, we, we've done a lot of tests with lots of different cells and can probably advise. Um, or uh, Alpha 4 is one of the, the, the favourites with with um, our research group here and, and customers, Alpha 4, Alpha 4 Plus. Uh, yeah, and, and I think I would, if you were going to choose one, go for Alpha 4 Plus. Right, thank you. Um, and Salah is asking, how does the cost of peptide matrices compared to traditional biomaterials like BME? I guess that's one that I can answer because we're actually selling them. It's comparable. Um, it's it's a, it's a similar cost, so you shouldn't see any noticeable difference. Um, next question is um, from Kagla. Um, how is the gelation or increased stiffness occurring when peptide hydrogelic is exposed to the cells? And a follow-up question, how do you functionalize the peptide gel to stay in a liquid form and transform it into a gel after injection? Um, so I think the first question uh, so we, we touched on earlier in terms of if it forms a gel and increases its stiffness when we add the cell culture media and it's the salts in the cell culture media that helps screen the charges uh, or, or, uh, the peptides and that helps cause their fiber fiber aggregation and that helps sort of stiffen uh, the gel. So it's playing around with the uh, interfiber interactions using salts that help um, uh, vary the stiffness, especially when you add the cells. Um, and how do we functionalize the cells uh, and get it to stay in? Oh, yeah, I've, I've lost the question. How do we functionalize the cells and get it to stay in liquid? So we yeah. functionalize the ce cells, um, but if we've got the peptide, let me just move the chat box out there. So we've got peptide, we uh, covalently tag uh, the end of the peptide with our functional sequence, whether that's a peptide sequence or a protein or a nucleotide, whatever we want to do. So we'll chemically conjugate it uh, to the peptide and then that's embedded within the fiber structure. So the peptide effectively tethers the function on the end of the fiber. Um, so we just mix it in uh, and then it's fully functionalized and you don't get leaching of the functionalized group out. And then you, it goes through from the viscous liquid to the gel transition, just as you normally would with any of the vanilla of the plain gels, as I call them. Great, thank you. So final questions for, for Seb. Um, so Luke is asking um, what, what your further research plans might be um, with, with the project that you were um, explaining. Yeah, so, um, so I touched on it briefly there. Uh, really like uh, the aim of the project was to build this like artificial bone marrow niche. And we've sort of got a, a model niche that we're happy with. We're still doing some research on it to try and continue to optimize it and demonstrate that it's doing what we what we think it's doing and try to understand a little bit more why it's doing what uh, what it's doing. But uh, really the, the next step of the project that we're trying to push for now is uh, developing this, this CAR T therapy. Uh, so we're trying to uh, use uh, car jerk cats as opposed to car T cells uh, just because of the, the ease of their use compared to car T cells and trying to get that off the ground and figure out a uh, an, an official car construct to introduce to our jerk cat cells in order to efficiently uh, kill CD33 positive cells. So maybe you can answer this question as well. It's from uh, Yanis, and it's asking, um, did you notice any difference in the gelation process and the property of the gel due to the salt? For example, TFA, HCL, acetate, et cetera. Um, so I only used uh, one type of media predominantly. I used uh, DMEM with uh, FBS. So, uh, so I didn't try different types of... Uh, media with different salts in them and so on and um, in terms of the gelation process you know like Hayley said the gel comes uh, already pretty much gelated and then uh, adding the salts just uh, helps to sort of enhance the stiffness of the gel but I, I didn't really notice any differences between the different gels in terms of how they gelate. Right don't know if you have any observations on that Aileen? Um, 
No, not really. Uh, they, they, they're all quite similar in how they behave uh, in terms of the kinetics and that kind of thing. Um, so users, it, 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 alpha two is just a little bit stiffer um, once you add the cell culture media uh, to it. But in terms of handling, they're all quite similar-ish. So Roxana is asking, is it possible to perform coating of peptide of peptigels? Um, I'm, I think that I think I'm assuming, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Roxana, that you mean a coating of plates uh, with the peptigels. Then yes, you can coat plates um, with the peptigels, and it's just pipetting a little bit on, and then um, uh, centrifuging uh, down to get or you get a nice uniform coating or banging it on the bench till you get a nice uniform coating. But again, there's a protocol uh, that can help show you how you do that. And Aki, Aki is asking, how can you recover cells or organoids from peptigels? Yeah, so we've done a little bit of that um, and uh, we're doing more work on, on the organoids uh, as, as we speak here as well. Um, so the, there's sort of a protocol in terms of dilution um, and also sort of mechanical agitation. You can also try, and, and uh, Seb can maybe talk, because I know Heath, I think you've done a little bit of this as well, um, in terms of um, uh, digesting uh, the gel to try to get the cells back out for recovery. Um, but typically some, some dilution with mechanical agitation. And again, uh, we've got some details on how you can do that. Uh, I think, I haven't checked actually, I think they'll be on the website for cell guidance systems. Okay, and uh, anonymous question, do you have any experience with pouring the hydrogel into embedding matrix and sectioning on a cryostat? Um, good question. We have done, we've certainly done, we've done a lot of histology uh, with the gels and we've set the gels, um, fixed the gels. We have done some work with the cryostat, not a lot. Um, I'm not sure if others have, uh, who've used the gels. Um, I've done a lot of cryo work without setting the gel, so uh, you know cryo microscopy. Um, but yeah, that's something I can have a think about and probably get back to you on that. Um, what's the difference, Roxana is asking, between peptide gels and acrylamide gels? Um, so it's, yeah, it's just it's the it's the building block. Um, so effectively, the, the acrylamides is a polymer uh, based system, polyacrylamides. Um, and they are, are they chemically cross-linked, I think? Um, uh, whereas the peptides, it's all physical. It's just a molecular building block. Um, and it's all through physical self-assembly. So it's much easier to manipulate and handle and do some downstream processing on. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's the building block. So it's, you're looking at peptide molecules versus acrylamide polymers uh, and the cross-linking mechanisms. And are acrylamide gels ever used for 3D cell culture work? Not a lot, I don't think. Well, you've got, um, no, I, I don't think, I think they, but they are, but they, they also shrink a lot in culture over time. Um, from what I remember. Uh, so we have got one paper uh, where we've looked at pancreatic cancer cells and we've looked at sort of polyacrylamide gels. You, you end up shrinking uh, the system or it shrinks when you add the media on the cells. So then you end up with something that's different from what you start with. Um, whereas the peptide gels, they don't shrink. Um, and then I, I believe it's, it's tricky to try to break the polymer down, but I'm, we haven't used them ourselves. Okay. We've got just a few more questions. I, I realize that we've come up um, on the hour, but we'll we'll carry on if that's okay, just to answer these few more questions. Um, so the next one is, what is the hydrophobic part of the peptide gel? Is it a hydrophobic amino acids or a lipid tail? Yes, yeah, so hydrophobic amino acids. So um, there are peptide systems you can get, but there's which are surfactant like, which have got the hydrophobic tail. But these are it's all it's all amino acid based, so it's all natural um, uh, amino acids that are used in proteins, and so it's 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 that 
is the uh, source of the hydrophobicity. So Salah is asking, um, how do peptide matrices reduce input variability compared to traditional biomaterials? And I think this is one of the, the key strengths of the, the technology. Um, so uh, I, I guess with, it depends exactly what, what you're comparing it to, but the, the peptide hydrogels, because they are the building block is made synthetically. Um, we know exactly what we've got. So it does what it says on the tin effectively. So we can take the, the, the building block and we can use it to make our materials. So you get the same thing every single time and the manufacturing processes are set up now so that you get the same hydrogels every time. Um, uh, whereas the more traditional uh, biomaterials that people use for 3D cell culture, you know, you're taking, looking at your basal uh, membranes, uh, systems like matrigel gel treks or collagens, then they come from the natural sources. So, you know, they've got that big batch to batch variability uh, because they're the animal derived. Um, and also they've got a whole different um, uh, growth factors and other bits and pieces in, in there as well, remnants uh, from uh, where they've come from that can influence and are known to influence um, uh, cell behavior and that's why you know when, when when you buy those you're told buy a big batch for all your experiments so you get the same results uh, it's a known variability whereas peptogels um, don't have that uh, at all which is great have you tried any in vivo characterization with neuronal tissue and if yes what was the outcome um there is a paper coming out on this uh it's in the next or is there a paper out already? Uh, in the two or three weeks um, uh, that, that is looking at, at, at that exactly. Um, so it it can be injected um, into uh, the brain for looking at stroke repair uh, and uh, cells will actually then uh, grow and you'll get the neuronal outgrowth from that. So uh, yeah, watch out for that paper. Um, but that kind of thing can be can be done. Yeah, I think there's, um, I think I know the paper you're talking about, um, Alberta mentioned it, and I think it's available as a preprint already. Ah, okay. It will be, will be published properly soon. Um, uh, next question from Zhuan Yuan, hopefully I've pronounced that closely to what it actually is. May I ask how the beta sheet structure is visualised, please? Um, so... Uh, another good question. So typically we use infrared spectroscopy um, and that tells us uh, sort of the secondary uh, structure of the peptide within the system so we can detect beta sheet structure and we can quantify it. We've also done um, high resolution TEM now uh, and we can actually see how these materials are coming together, the beta sheets and the interspacing um, and also X-ray um, uh, scattering and x-ray diffraction uh, typically the sort of materials characterization techniques we use to look at the fiber formation thank you and diane is asking how do you split 3d organoid cultures for passaging and expanding uh, the cell line is it uh, biomechanical dissociation yeah so um as we sort of mentioned before there so there's a combination of um, mechanical and uh, dilution that help disassociate um the organoids from the gel and then you can take them and, and passage them uh, and, and put them through several series of those uh, steps so a follow-up question similar from uh, another attendee asking do you need any special reagents to dissolve hydrogel when trying to recover organoids uh no, uh, from what we've done uh, in terms of, uh, you can use them and, and Seb's done a little bit of that uh, and you can, you know, like trypsin and, and you know, digest the systems. Um, but if you want to keep the organoids done, um, then you can you can sort of dilute, uh, dilute them down and, and use similar processes as, you know, extracting cells and, and uh, from the gels and cells from tissues as well. Okay, we've got a couple of questions here I think are addressed to uh, Seb. Um, Aki is asking how long the BM cultures remain viable? Uh, so at the moment we've looked at it up to 14 days. Um, we have like different levels of viability under the different gels and so on, but um, 
up to 14 days under Delta 1, which is the one that we chose, we saw a reasonably good viability. Great. Um, and again, for you, Seb, did you observe CAR T cells entering the hydrogel? Uh, so we've not actually got to the stage where we have uh, finished designing the CAR Ts uh, yet, uh, but uh, that's definitely something we'll be looking at, as well as whether uh, the other cell types that we're including in our system uh, also penetrate the hydrogel or not. Okay. Um, Ludovine is just clarifying uh, an earlier question, uh, which was talking about, um, she's saying it's adding it on top. Yeah, so we will be at, we will be adding it on top. It's the is the plan at the moment, although of course that, that might change. Right. Um, so, let's see, Zhuan Yuan again is asking, um, how would you fix the hydrogel for histology? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I. We do we we do two different methods. Um, one we use paraffin, and I can't remember what the other is, but I can ask my group and get back to you. <laughs> that's really that's a really supervisor answer to the question. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Seb, uh, with the hands-on experience. Uh, I've done some cryo sectioning before, but not uh, not anything else. No, sorry. Yeah, we have done it, and I know there's two methods that the 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 group use um, and I know there's a protocol out there uh, published for it um, but I can't think what it is to be honest sorry and um, Seb again um, do you see different effects of the gels on the cell types and how do they compare with your expectations from other models of bone marrow uh, yes so uh, I showed a little bit of data on this where I looked at uh, the levels of nest in an SEF expression of mesenchymal stem cells that are cultured under uh, various different pept gels. Uh, and uh, we eventually ended up selecting Delta-1 as the one that best promotes the phenotype we wanted in the mesenchymal stem cells. And then we've just been going forward with that. So in terms of how the hematopoietic stem cells have responded to the system, we've only exposed them to Delta-1. Uh, and they've responded similarly to how they have to collagen, um, which is uh, has been used in a similar system as it has been demonstrated to maintain naive hematopoietic stem cells for uh, a reasonably extended period of time. So we, we demonstrated uh, the, the first stages of that, uh, although we need to do further experiments in order to, uh, to, to fully justify making that claim for the Delta-1 system. And Ali Reza is asking um, what are the most important parameters of esophageal tissue engineering is the mechanical properties of the scaffold. Are the peptigels strong enough to meet the mechanical needs? Um, so again, it depends a little bit. So you can make really stiff hydrogels um, and get cells in them and, and the cells grow. But what in terms of the esophagus application, we want them to be soft enough so that you can deliver them through an endoscope and spray the surface of the esophagus so they'll move through sort of the um, nozzle. Um, but we don't need necessarily to match the uh, esophagus tissue um, with the hydrogels because the hydrogel is there to effectively deliver the cells and keep the cells and protect the cells for a certain period of time until they start producing and putting down their own matrix to then effectively re-epithelialize uh, the surface of the esophagus. So sometimes you don't, or and quite often I think you don't need to always match the mechanical strength of the organ or tissue you're targeting with the hydrogel. Um, we can probably do it, you know, from one Pascal with up to about 50,000 uh, Pascals. Um, but yeah, you, you, for, for the esophagus application, we, we're, we're not matching the mechanical strength, but using it as a delivery vehicle and scaffold and support for the cells until they um, uh, do their thing and put down their own matrix. Sarah is asking, could the hydrogel help mimic vascularization in 3D spheroids? Um, so the hydrogel probably on its own um, will not induce 
vascularization. So what you need is the cell types that will form and uh, the vas uh, the or form the vascularization and form the the, the tubular structures, um, and then the hydrogels will support the growth of those cell types, um, as we've done with the Hu Huvex cells. Uh, so there's nothing per se with the hydrogel uh, in, to to induce that. Sometimes you know there's a research question in and around like printing and and and, and aligning the hydrogels into sort of fibrous structures or macroscopic fibrous structures to help guide the growth of cells in a particular one-dimensional direction and that's something that is a potential we're looking into for different for other applications but typically as long as you've got the cells embedded within your hydrogel uh, to create the vascularized structures then that's that's how you would do it right and uh, moving on to the last questions um has there been any research on muscle cells using peptogels Um, not, not that we've done, but I know that we, we, uh, have, um, given gels, uh, soul, soul gels to somebody that was doing that. And I, I, I don't know, I, I haven't heard how they've got on, um, but we haven't ourselves. And uh, so, uh, I think this is the last question is just asking for clarification of how, um, using hydrogel helps produce clearer confocal microscopy images so it helps um a, 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 i wouldn't say it produces clearer and clearer than what um uh, uh hydrogel uh, confocal images but it does allow you because they're they're transparent it does allow you to to do your plain slicing through the system and, and look at the confocal confocal images um so yeah it's it clearer than what it's nothing in it that produces magically clear images per se. It's just that they're transparent and they allow allow the 3D imaging, whether Great. it be present or live dead, that kind of thing. Thank you. So I think that's the, the last question. So I'm um, just really like to thank very much uh, Aileen and Seb for uh, their great talk today. Really enjoyed listening to them. I hope everybody uh, who's joined the webinar has enjoyed it too and has, has got something out of that and has been inspired uh, maybe to start using um, these peptogels uh, in your research. I mean, certainly the field is is moving away from um, matrix gel and, and all the problems that matrix gel has. And um, Luke has asked if if I'm excited to be uh, um, involved in this. I, I certainly am. I think uh, it's, it's a great thing um, for the science 3d cell culture and all the uh, potential applications of that and how this technology can help that move forward so um we'll leave it there um we'll follow up to this the re the recording will be made available um so if there's anything that you want to watch through um you'll be able to do that um so thank you very much for for participating and uh we hope we can uh be in touch with you and uh, help your needs in the near future. Thank you very much.